All right, welcome to Woodshed number one. I'm John Lamberton. Today, the lesson is gonna be on using a metronome at very slow tempos and the benefits that you can get from it. And uh, yeah, let's get started. All right, so in this lesson, the main things I wanna talk about are why would you use slow tempos and uh, why would you practice this way? How slow are we talking? And what even is slow, man? Plus, there will be some exercises because I want to make sure that this is applied and not theoretical, although this is going to mostly be a sort of conceptual lesson about uh, time and the interplay between frequency and duration. So let's get started. All right, so metronomes. <clears throat> metronomes, to me, as you can see here, I think of sort of like a ballet dancer might think of a bar. Um, this is just sort of like their standard reference point that they use for development and you know woodshedding basically. So um, what I love about metronomes is that they provide a very uh, reliable and mechanical reference point for us for standard tempos. And basically that means that they keep us honest as musicians. Uh, you know, I looked something up briefly about practicing with the metronome. And the first thing that I saw was why you shouldn't be practicing with the metronome. And that's a psyop, don't believe that type of thing. Um, that's said by somebody who has no sense of rhythm. So um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but basically the, the metronome should be used to work the muscles and tendons, as it were, of your internal clock. And I'm saying here that in many ways it's its own instrument or ensemble, and that can be sort of um, beneficial in a way that's going to make it too easy. And so we don't really want it to be acting as an instrument or an ensemble. We want it to be acting more as like a microscope or some sort of uh, means of verifying our own accuracy. Uh, we want to be doing most of the grunt work here. We want to be the ones that are carrying the rhythmic weight and sort of we're responsible for the uh, stakes of rhythmic time <laughs> that are up. So um, before we you know dive into too much of what I mean by that, I just want to note that um, it's kind of interesting that, you know, plenty of people really glorify perfect pitch or absolute pitch. Um, you know, back in the day, there would be like, you know, 13 CD sets that are sold uh, for how you can learn perfect pitch. And, you know, then we learned that it's mostly genetic. And I would argue that, you know, being able to say, oh, that's this pitch is kind of, you know, that's a little bit of like a... Uh, social construct uh, you know we're talking about frequencies and whatever you want to call it is fine but like the ability the ability to pull something out of nowhere or um, to you know sort of operate without a reference point that's more of a party trick than anything that's actually of use it's all about being able to do things uh, sort of relative to the reference point I think and so you know, you don't hear anybody talking about, quote, perfect pulse or perfect tempo or absolute tempo. You hear them talking about, you know, that drummer has great time or, yeah, he has a good sense of rhythm or whatever. But the way that I see it, um, something like relative pitch or intonation is a little bit closer to this. Uh, so, you know, that's the ability to have, you know, say, in the case of like intonation, you have a reference tone and then whatever pitch you're singing or playing on your instrument is going to be... Um, in some sort of clear relation to that that is precise. So I'm not really impressed by the ability to uh, you know operate without a reference point. Um, you know that's that seems again like a party trick. So don't you know go on glorifying that. It's not that cool. Um, so quick note on some higher tempos. Basically, um, the higher the tempo, the less of sort of the fundamental pulse this will be, like the less of the fundamental period it will be, rhythmically speaking, is going to become more of a subdivision. And this is interesting because like, you know, at, when we talk about pitch, a C is a C is a C, even though it's like, you know, uh, this frequency times two times two again, it's, you know, continually being multiplied or divided by two. So that's a big, a big difference there, but we consider them the same. And that's octave equivalence, and there's something similar for rhythm, and it's actually very nicely exemplified by the Rize rhythm, where you see sort of this Escher staircase thing that unifies time and makes you realize that um, you know a pulse 
has sub pulses in it and it has multiples of its pulse. So it's all kind of time is one of the main things I want to convey in this lesson. So um, if we take a metronome at a higher tempo, um, it's going to actually be kind of easy to play along with because it's essentially like you have a drummer. It's somebody who's taking care of a lot of the rhythm for you, something that you play along to. And so if you think about like, you know, going to karaoke and how that's easier than singing a cappella, um, or at the very least, it's less daunting, uh, or, you know, it, you know, karaoke is less transparent for a number of reasons and it has lower stakes. But if you're singing by yourself, uh, it's going to be all the stakes are on you. So you don't have a backing track, you don't have Mariah Carey singer, singing underneath you, etc. So um, additionally, there's like this energetic component where, you know, to sustain a tempo is, it's not just about being precise, it's about being continuously precise, having it ingrained, and sustaining that pace. So like, you know, if you start off sprinting, and then you start dragging, that's not having a good time. It doesn't matter how evenly you were running to start off. Um, if you're slowing down, you know, it's a problem. You need to sustain the rate. And that, that can be a lot to do because you want to keep it precise, but you also want to uh, sustain that energy. So I have this little uh, image over here that I did on my whiteboard. Um, you can see sort of uh, the top thing here that says X BPM. That's just an arbitrary tempo. And if we go to 2X that BPM, then it's essentially like we're putting notches in between it. Each of those could be its own fundamental pulse, um, but the same thing applies yet again when now you have four to the original one or two to the the second, you know, two x BPM. And so, at a certain point, if you're just going to keep on going faster, it's not going to be perceived as a pulse anymore. It's going to be perceived as a subdivision of a pulse or a harmonic of that pulse, basically. And so, uh, we we operate on a certain range of tempos that you know are sort of given to us but it's also like what our human bodies are comfortable with because you know to some degree um eventually you'll hit pitches and that's arguably a tempo as well it's just it's inhumanly fast because we're talking about like you know 400 something cycles per second versus you know two cycles per second or something like that so um in either case though they're basically a frequency and so it is a function of time and um, there's a unifying element there that's, I think, interesting to explore. So um, if you have the metronome at a high tempo, like if you have it set to the max tempo, um, you probably aren't fitting that much stuff into each beat. And it's sustaining most of the energy for you. So um, it's kind of like you have a very obvious cliff and you don't even need to really consider uh, going to the very edge because you, you know, you are being kept, uh, you know, within the grid, uh, you have something that is preventing you from going too far astray or from getting lost. Um, when you go to slower tempos, it's not this way though. So, <clears throat> uh, this is, you know, sort of briefly just touching on some ways that you could apply higher tempos and get some of the same, you know, uh, like benefits of keeping yourself honest. So if one were to use a, quote, smart metronome of some sort, um, basically, you know, like if you programmed something in, say, like max MSP or had some sort of logic to it that worked in a bit of arbitrary omission of these clicks, then that would be an interesting way to keep yourself honest. So, you know, you might, for instance, I'll, I'll set a metronome here. I have my handy dandy uh, old metronome, the, the old Korg KDM1 digital metronome, um, I'll say 144. So this is what 144 beats per minute sounds like. And selectively, maybe it would just it's kind of hard to roll this volume dial that quickly. But you know, if you just have it selectively omit clicks, it's like sort of nice analogy for this is like if you're in a class and the teacher or the professor or whatever um, doesn't simply just call on the student who you know you know knows the answer who's enthusiastically raising their hand in the front of the row instead they systematically choose a random student from the class and you know maybe that student hasn't even shown up to class and they get penalized for it and 
otherwise they wouldn't have gone unnoticed or they wouldn't have been noticed um but you know maybe they're embarrassed in front of the class because they don't know the answer they weren't paying attention so having that selective omission of a pulse it's a good way to keep yourself honest as well if you're using higher tempos but that's not what this is about we're going to be talking about slow tempos so let's get into some slow tempos okay why would we go slow is the first question i want to sort of get into you see here this nice set of uh, waves and uh, it's related to one's gait pattern you see heel strike to toe off at 62 percent of the way um, it's kind of interesting to see somebody be so analytical about one's walking gait but <clears throat> uh, the reason that we're talking about gait here is because it's a great analogy as well um, if you go to a slower tempo uh, you know if you slow down your walking gait for instance to as slow as possible, you start to realize maybe you don't even know how to walk that well. Uh, if you are jogging though, it's kind of a mindless meh, meh, the right, left, right, left. Um, you're able to just get into the locomotion of it without thinking about the microscopic sort of uh, you know elements of your actual technique of walking. So um, when you go down to these really low tempos, it's kind of demanding because it requires that you have entrained to your reference tempo um, that you're getting from the metronome and that you've internalized that. And so, you know, basically you can't cheat and you have to pull your own weight and you have to sustain the sense of pace of that given tempo. So <clears throat> if you, you know, have a very fast metronome going, it's essentially, it's like the drummer's playing a hi-hat to show you where every single thing is, where every single sub beat is. And what we want to do is get fewer answers given to us and be responsible for demonstrating that we know the answers of where each sub pulse goes ourselves. And there's some more benefits to this, but this is probably the, the most important one is just that it is more cognitively demanding. It's more neurologically demanding, unlike going faster, which eventually becomes like if you sprint, it's more of a, an athletic limitation. But if you're going, if you're walking as slow as possible, you sort of have to assess the exact way that you're walking. And uh, you might not really know how to walk. You might have sort of weird strategies to avoid certain uh, postures that you aren't that comfortable with. And you know, <laughs> I have tons of these where I'm just sort of avoiding having my leg in this place. And so, you know, ideally we want to ingrain these pristine uh, formal elements to like the posture of our playing to our technique and all that because ultimately you know uh, you know picking for a guitarist is like walking and you want to make sure that your technique is perfect because if you do repetitive stress on an injury you're I mean if you do repetitive uh, motions with bad technique you're going to get an injury and if you continue to repeat that with an injury you're you're going to be in a bad situation so um, I'd say it's also kind of uh, a good way to get in a sort of meditative state or to dial in your awareness of time. So uh, this is probably my favorite blog post to suggest to people. And it's uh, from the opentheory.net blog by Mike Johnson of QRI and it's titled a future for neuroscience. And despite being uh, about neuroscience, I feel like I, I love to see it through the musical lens. And I feel like it's a perfect article for people who want to think about, um, neuroscience through a sort of rhythmic or uh, harmonic or musical lens. And so he introduces this idea of entrainment quotient, which he abbreviates as ENQ. And this is like an alternative to emotional intelligence, which, you know, we call EQ sometimes like emotional quotient or emotion quotient or something. Um, and so the idea is that one's uh, sort of emotional tone has to do with their ability to entrain to something so you know if you've ever been totally on a different wavelength than somebody else that's that's <laughs> kind of a you know a, a fun way to say it it's not literally that you're on a different I mean I guess it is literally that you're on a different wavelength but uh, the ability to train and train to somebody else's wavelength is a great skill emotionally to have and you know it's not simply that we have one wavelength each it's that we have this you know, crazy uh, multi-dimensional geometry of wavelengths that, um, you know, combine or don't combine into consonance or dissonance. And so 
your ability to conform to this wavelength um, is a great thing and potentially you know could help you develop your enq so <clears throat> if we're sending a metronome to a very slow tempo uh it's going to be more challenging than just having it be you know obvious and you know clicking at 150 beats per minute or something like that and so uh in the case of you know brain waves or something like people might talk about like alpha brain waves being a about you know eight to twelve hertz, um, but when we're talking about tempos, you know my metronome uh, that I use here that I just played on the mic is uh, basically going to go between 0.65 hertz and 3.5 hertz, and so that's you know those are the equivalent to 40 to 208 beats per minute, but it's put in terms of hertz. So again, you know you can convert all these things into the equivalent of another thing. You can convert hertz into beats per minute. It's kind of weird, but you can. And so you can also take this a step further by um, sort of empirically eva evaluating the degree of synchrony that you've achieved. And so this is what I'm trying to do here with um, this waveform that is on a grid. And you can see that a lot of it does line up, but it's not perfectly lined up with the grid. And so, you know, this is a good sort of way to come to face to face with exactly how um you know well you can entrain to a certain wavelength okay so why don't more people practice like this well basically uh you know metronomes determine a lot of the norms with tempo and so with my metronome that i've been using here it doesn't go down to 20 beats per minute it stops at 40 beats per minute and incidentally it offers you a tuning tone of 440 hertz. And I'm not gonna go around saying that that is better or worse than any other tuning frequency, but uh, it's interesting that there's a nice clean number that we conform to um, instead of sort of having a sense of arbitrary reference point that then has constants within it. As in, you know, you can have one string of your guitar tuned and the rest can be out of tune relative to that but you could also have the whole guitar in tune uh, with itself and be out of tune with something else, like the standardized reference pitch. Maybe you have your guitar perfectly tuned to, you know, 445 uh, for the A. And so everything's a tad sharp, but it sounds perfect with itself. It's only a problem when you are combining it with something else that's tuned to, say, 435, where there's going to be a difference of 10 hertz. Um, so... You know, while you can find metronomes that go down to 20 beats per minute, it's kind of tedious, but it is doable. And I'll provide a link for some of these, um, even though they aren't my favorites to use. Um, and I would say it's even more of an ask to get metronomes that go below 20. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I found one that goes down to one. And, you know, this sort of starts to ask that we talk about rhythm and time in a different way. So I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, number two reason that people don't practice like this is basically that it's painful. It's like the feeling of hearing yourself on uh, an answering machine and being like, oh, is that me? It's the feeling of uh, showing somebody your waveform that doesn't line up to the grid and being like, oh, shit, I, I'm i not, you know, <laughs> following the metronome perfectly. It's super objective, super cold, and doesn't care how you feel. So it's, you know, a lot of people want to just convince themselves that they're good. Um, and, you know, metronomes only click. That's it. That's all they do. So, um, if you aren't clicking with it, you basically, you know, don't have a good enough sense of rhythm. And I will say that um, the very best people with the best time when they play with a metronome, they make the metronome click vanish. And it's kind of magical. But also, you know, the best drummers, if they were practicing with a metronome, I feel like it's a negotiation. It's like, you know, when you're having a conversation, maybe somebody uh, cuts in and sort of asserts that they, you know, are going to speak now and then maybe you back off there's a push and pull that you can have even though it's a mechanical uh you know timekeeper of a metronome okay so here's some tempo ranges and you know again we're talking sort of in a general range of like 40 to 200 something and you know maybe down to 20 ideally but um you'll see all sorts of stuff over youtube that's like all over youtube that's like um you know, uh, this guitarist plays the fastest thing ever at a million beats per minute. And that's, a, of course, absurd to say a million beats per minute is stupid. But, you know, even to say 1000 beats per minute doesn't really make sense. That's not a tempo. And we talk about tempo and beats per minute generally. So, um, 
if we use a standard scope of something like 40 to 208, 208 beats per minute, um, then we'll get these sort of uh, qualitative descriptions that, you know, this chart from the flutecoach.com will you know, say like uh, Allegro is 120 to 140, um, you know, Andante is this, Adagio is 66 to 76. So, you know, I forget what all of these mean, but like, you know, it's kind of like walking tempo or um, lively, uh, you know, tightening gradually faster, or holding back um, these. It's kind of like you're projecting some sort of, um, you know, mood or quality to it that doesn't necessarily have to be there. I prefer to think of it kind of like an arbitrary number. And I think that the way that um, tempo and duration have an inverse relationship is the interesting thing to explore here, not kind of like, oh, that's a walking tempo. That means that you should play this way. Um, I, I'm more interested in what is instead of saying what ought and what's helpful rather than you know saying <laughs> uh, any sort of prescription here. So um, to sort of just get into this with one of our first exercises, um, I want to talk about how jazz musicians might use a metronome, essentially like a snare or uh, like the foot of a hi-hat. And so um, they'll essentially choose a tempo that's half the tempo they're actually playing at, for the quarter note at least, and then they'll displace it so that that click is uh, the backbeat or the two or the four essentially, or maybe it's just the three. And so this is a cool thing to do because um, it's kind of like a lo-fi drummer that you're playing along with to keep your time, but it's not really, it's not playing all four beats, it's playing just two and four. So you're still responsible for coming in at the right time and asserting that you know where one is, but it's still kind of like one and two, and two, and two. it gives you a sense of the backbeat. Okay, so as we do this um, exercise, you know, we're gonna be sticking at 60 beats per minute. I chose that just because that's literally one second, a thousand milliseconds. And so it's sort of a, it's not even that slow really. It's, you know, we'll be playing at 120 beats per minute, which isn't slow at all, but it's using one of the slower metronome markings. And so as we do this, you know, basically I would say, play whatever you feel like, play a tune, play a tone. This type of exercise is meant to be just a generic module that can be applied to whatever you're practicing at the time, uh, any sort of repertoire, whatever. Okay, so here we are, exercise one. Uh, we're gonna be using 60 beats per minute. And that click that's you know shown here in the top uh, notation Instead of being one, two, three, four, it's going to become two and four. So you have to displace it by hearing one and then the click will come in. So let's set it to 60 beats per minute. So this is literally one second each. Okay, so once you've settled in and you hear one, two, three, four, that type of thing. We're going to try to move this now to twice the tempo and displace it so that you hear this is two and four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Feels good with a swing type feel if you wanna you know, practice a tune like this. Or you know, straight, boom, boom, cha, boom, boom, cha, boom, cha, boom, boom, cha, boom, cha, boom, boom, cha, boom, 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 boom. So it's functioning as a snare, that type of thing. Um, now, that was pretty easy because it's sixty beats per minute, and you might ask generally, what is even hard about this? And it's simply because you are responsible for something that uh, is not being obviously, you know, relayed by the metronome. You have to, you know, come in at beat one. You have to do the whole uh, navigation of what the click functions as. So this circle here on the rest, the exact moment that you have to come in to assert that you know and that you've embodied and internalized the tempo. So let's try that again, 60 beats per minute. So look at the top and you see one, two, three, four and see these first two are two and three and the second two are two and three again so 
you fit two bars in the space of the top bar and you displace it. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And so again, just take uh, you know half the tempo of whatever real tempo you're using and you can set this to be the backbeat. And if you wanna get even more complicated with this and maybe we will in a future video, you can do something wacky like set this set the metronome to be um you know anticipated note or like a push on say the uh you know the and of whatever or you could even be like a 16th, 16th note anticipation so that would be something like so chicka 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 so now we have that's the two and the four with 16th notes. So now it's anticipating the 16th note before the one. That's pretty hard to do, and I didn't do a great job of it there, but. Um, you know, basically you can apply this it doesn't have to be the two and the four it can be anything and it doesn't have to overlap with the bar so that gets really complicated though and um we'll get into more complicated stuff right now i want to talk about going slower so let's scooch it down all the way to the bottom of my metronome at 40 beats per minute now so it's really your responsibility to hit the one or at least assert that you know where the one is um you know i'm not saying that <laughs> as a musician you have to be like i play the one but um we want to know that you know where one is and that's that's good enough so uh you also sort of have to ingrain this and let go so your body can intuitively engage with this and you can let go and not be overly intellectual about it so let's try this again but at 40 beats per minute so that means that it will be essentially two bars of 80 beats per minute with each click on the two and the four It's also a lot harder after hearing 60 because you have to recalibrate everything in your mind. So one, two, three, that's the top one. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So again, that's functioning as a backbeat. This would be great to like practice a slow blues with so you really know where that backbeat is and you can feel sort of the like kick snare i'm not saying with the measurement but kick snare kick snare kick snare that type of thing okay so let's talk a little bit more about why we should be focusing on slow stuff slow metronome markings um and so the answer is basically polyrhythms and tuplets. And more generally, I'd say that this is about getting comfortable with divisive rhythms, as in rhythms that come from dividing units of time rather than multiplying units of time. So to say odd meter is generally easy. It's easy to do, you know, if you, especially if you have a fast sort of tempo uh, underlying it, if you say, okay, it's seven, eight, okay. That's just seven re repetitions of the base unit of an eighth note. However, um, you know, we generally talk about time signatures where the denominator, if specified, is a multiple of two. You don't see anything like 712, and that could exist, and some people think, no, that can't exist. And no, absolutely it can, but it's just complicated and there's no point in doing it unless you're comfortable with these divisive rhythms where you have some sort of reference. because. I mean, as we'll see later, you can basically re-notate or re-spell a lot of things um, as something that looks completely different contextually. So um, I would say that, you know, practicing polyrhythms with a metronome is best to do very slow. Um, if you take, for instance, like the fastest tempo on this metronome, which is 208 beats per minute, you're really, you're pretty lucky if you can squeeze three notes in. And um, on like your native instrument, like for me on guitar, that's probably going to be reasonable to get three notes into each click. So let's hear what 208 sounds like. Um, with my voice, it's going to be a lot harder, but I can, yeah, I can wing it. 
So this is 208. So chicka 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 That's two. One two three one two three one two three one two three. Can't really get it. It's really hard if you're speaking. It's a lot easier if you're picking, you know. But you certainly, you certainly cannot get five notes in there. So the complexity of your polyrhythm um, is kind of constrained by, you know, how fast you're playing it. And so when somebody says, like, I'm playing an 11 against 12 polyrhythm, <clears throat> Jacob Collier and your fraudulent ass, if he's saying, oh, yeah, 11 against 12, I don't believe you. Like, 11 against 12 is a wildly complex polyrhythm that really has to be spread out and so you know if we we're saying like uh i'm i'm gonna have a smallest unit of 100 milliseconds then you know that's already going to take like a good like 20 seconds or whatever to resolve so you can't fit a polyrhythm like of that complexity into you know essentially a beat it's absurd it doesn't make sense <laughs> so um I would say also, you know, as the tempo or whatever you know rate you're going at, as it gets faster, it's going to be increasingly demanding on a physical level. But as you go slower, it's generally going to be more demanding on a cognitive level or a sort of uh, neurological or coordination level. And so um, to get back to tuplets, you could, for instance, say if you're working on quintuplets, you could try to fit it over two clicks. And so that's what I'm trying to show here on this uh whiteboard drawing so um basically these circles and the like these circles here are supposed to be clicks and this is you know the division line um if it's these five things over the space of two then the second click is smack dab in the middle of the third beat and you know you could sort of do your best and estimate it and try to get a feel for it but you're essentially just quote earballing it you know um like y if you're eyeballing it like as i did with this visual you know it's not precise it's it's sufficient for an example but um it's totally imprecise and so to really get that five over two which is pretty hard um in this case uh you're gonna have to at least be comfortable or have some sense of the five over one in the back of your head and then each of those single things gets multiplied so one two three four five one two three four five becomes one two three four five so you group uh those you know it's five plus five that's ten and you instead now you like you would do <clears throat> one two three four five one two three four five but on the bottom you have to do one two one two one two one two one two and if you try to just skip the subdivision then that's going to get complicated to have that middle beat splits straight in half and you're not really gonna know if you're doing it right if you're just earballing it so um I, I, i'll get into some threshold stuff in another video um basically there's like a pretty reasonable threshold for each tempo and this is again why i think that's great to practice with slow tempos so let's talk about these tuplets in another exercise and this will involve some math i'm sorry okay so here we are with quintuplets 40 beats per minute Okay, what does 40 beats sound like? 40 beats per minute. Okay, so this is two, three, four. Now, each of these pulses gets five subdivisions now. And this is getting at that divisive rhythm thing. It's one thing to say two, three, times four now times five, times six. That's multiplicative. You're counting how many multiples or repetitions of something has occurred versus dividing a, an amount of time into an equal amount of parts, which is a lot harder. And like, if you think about even just doing math, if you do multiplication versus division, division is arguably harder because it involves things like remainders or fractions or, you know, uh, you know God forbid, floating points. And so it's a whole different thing. And it, it's a lot harder for us um, as humans, I think, to just pull out that division. And so that's why you really have to be tuned in and embody these rhythms. So here we are again, 40 beats per minute. One, two, three, four, five. 
one, two, three, four, five, 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 one, two, three, four, five. That's what it sounds like. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. <sighs> okay, so that's not that fast. This notation, uh, you know, whenever somebody sees it, they're like, oh, that's complicated, but nope, it's not that complicated. It just has quintuplets in it. The tempo is slow enough, though, that it's not really complicated at all. It's not fast. It's not even demanding. It just requires a little bit of uh, thought about, oh, I'm taking this pulse. I'm ingraining it in my mind and my body. I'm, you know, following along with it. And then I'm going to split it into equal parts according to this division. Okay. So the question that I'd ask about this is how long is each of these little X's here? Um, there are 20 X's here altogether. There are four groups of five quintuplets. Um, or yeah, there, there are 20 little impulses here in the span of this whole measure. And so I want to know how long the interval is for each of these little impulses. So how would we go about this? Well, um, you know, I think it's somewhat of a disservice for us to standardize the stylization of beats per minute as BPM rather than like literally beats slash minute, because then you can think of it as a function, like a rate uh, where it's this many things per second instead of just kind of like a number. <clears throat> so, you know, 40 pulses each minute. So that means for every 60 seconds, there are 40 pulses. 60 divided by 40 means that each pulse is 1.5 seconds. So each of these groups of five here is in the span of 1.5 seconds. And when we're down to this level, it's easier to talk about it in milliseconds. So 100, or sorry, 1,500 milliseconds. And we're gonna evenly divide those into five. So that means that each of these little X's here, each impulse in this measure is 300 milliseconds long, which that's not that fast. It looks, you know, if you just quickly glanced at it, you'd probably say, oh, that's complicated. That's pretty easy. But now let's say, um, Wait a second, what am I doing here? A repeat of the slide? <laughs> well, okay. What other context might 300 milliseconds be in? And how else might we notate this exercise? Well, you know, first of all, 300 milliseconds is not specifically going to come up as quintuplets at 40 beats per minute. That's one of literally infinite options for how it might come up. So, how could we notate this very same exercise differently? Well, I'll give you an example. Okay, so we're here. I've rewritten it at 200 beats per minute. So each of these pulses is the same as each of these quintuplet pulses. Okay, don't believe me? Let's try 40 beats per minute here. Here's the click. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So that's basically our tempo now. And we put the to 200 beats per minute. What do you know? So it's the same thing. These look nothing alike uh, the way that they're notated, but they sound exactly the same and you perceive them differently. So. You can rewrite things in a gazillion ways, but only if you're comfortable sort of flip-flopping and alternating between the domains of, you know, frequency, rate, uh, period, that type of thing, and duration or, uh, you know, uh, length of time, etc. So <clears throat> just a little quiz, uh, since, you know, there are essentially infinite options. Uh, if basically each of these 300 millisecond units is one of 11 even divisions of the quarter note pulse, then what, quote, tempo would the pulse be following? Go ahead and pause the video if you want to try to solve it on your own first. <laughs> so uh, the answer here, basically the way you figure it out is you say each unit is 300 milliseconds. I know that 300 milliseconds is 1 11th of the pulse. So we do 11 times 300. So that gives us 3,300 milliseconds. And then 
how many uh, times does 3,300 fit into a minute or 60,000 milliseconds? What tempo would th then be? So it's going to be 60,000 divided by 3,300. What is that? It's basically 18.181818 repeating uh, beats per minute. And let's go on to number two. If we have 300 millisecond units and uh, it's part of a tuplet, and so we don't know what the tuplet is, but we know that the pulse of the tempo, or the tempo is basically 15.4 beats per minute. So we need to figure out what sort of tuplet it is. <clears throat> okay, so again, pause the video if you want to figure it out on your own. I'm going to just go ahead and dive into how I figured this out. So 15.4 beats per minute. Let's switch that to duration. So if we have 15.4 beats per minute, that means that 60,000 is going to be divided by 15.4. And that gives us our uh, duration, which is basically 3,900, a little bit short of 3,900, uh, like 39, uh, or sorry, 3,898. Uh, and how many times is 13 going to fit into 3,900? The answer is 13. And so there's a rounding error here, um, which is why it's good to sort of be able to go from absolutes to relative, because, you know, it's good to have the absolute numbers on hand, sort of like it's good to have the weights, like the, the amount of weight on hand if you're in the gym. But uh, uh, at the end of the day, you know, we don't want to be saying things like 15.4 beats per minute. We you know, if you switch tempo suddenly, you want to have sort of a scaling factor. So everything should be about how this relates proportionally and in relative terms. That's what music is all about to me. So let's do some more tuplet stuff. <clears throat> and real quick with a hot take. Uh, so tuplets should be primes. Um, and by this, I mean, of course, like a prime number. So that's, you know, uh, three, five, you know, I guess two, but 3, 5, uh, 7, 11, uh, 13, 17, 19, 23, uh, 29, 31, uh, 37, I think. Um, anyway, so these are the only numbers that are worth making tuplets of. And why? It's because otherwise they're going to be redundant. To say a 12 tuplet might be convenient uh, and... I mean, you know, I'll be truthful and say that I do something like a 12 tuplet out of convenience sometimes, but a 12 tuplet is essentially, you know, a triplet that's two octaves up, two rhythmic octaves up, because it's uh, taking a triplet and then multiplying it by four. So, you know, you can notate it differently, but uh, it, I think it's interesting to just, you know, consider the difference between uh, composite tuplets and prime tuplets. I think that primes are the ones that make sense to do. Because <clears throat> otherwise, I mean, you could say like a triplet and then twice as fast, and that's essentially a sextuplet. Uh, or, you know, quintuplets, but four times as fast, and that's a, <laughs> a 20 tuplet, whatever that is. So uh, let's do exercise 2.1, uh, or 2.2 rather. And in 2.1, uh, we were doing quintuplets, or five equal divisions of a pulse. And so for 2.2, Let's try 11 equal divisions of the pulse, and we'll do it at the same tempo. So I'm not sure if these are Hendek couplets or just 11 tuplets or whatever, but we're going to be at 40 beats per minute. Um, if anybody knows what the very most official consensus term is for 11 notes in the space of four, I'd be curious to know. But uh, so we have these 11 tuplets here or whatever. And a question that I will ask before we hear sort of what this sounds like is, What's the duration of each of these little units here? Because um, we have 44 units in the bar. And so uh, each pulse is broken into 11 even subunits. And so I want to know how long that little chunk of time is. Okay, so we know 40 beats per minute is 1,500 milliseconds. And so we now just simply divide that by 11. And we have about 137 milliseconds. Again, I rounded up here, so just note that this can be a little bit problematic when actually implementing these rhythms, but it's good to be able to put in absolutes if you want. So it's, you know, 136 points something, basically. 
<laughs> okay, so another question is, just how much faster is the rate of the 11 tuplet or Hindek couplet than the quintuplet? And this is pretty easy. You don't even need to really know the tempo. You just need to know that it is the same tempo. And so that's simply 11 divided by 5 equals 2.2. So compared to our example with the quintuplets, this is going to be 2.2 times faster. Okay, so let's hear what this sounds like at 40 beats per minute. And keep in mind, you know, again, if you're at 208, you're lucky to get three uh, divisions of that pulse. There's absolutely no way to practice 11 even divisions of a uh, tempo that fast. That's why it's great to do super slow and even slower would be better because then we can like, you know, go to 13, we can go further and further. Um, <clears throat> and there's, you know, again, a threshold for each of these tempos. So here's 40. Okay, so you internalize that first. One, two, three, etc. Now, to fit eleven units in each of that, each of those pulses, is going to be a little bit difficult. It's hard to say because you know some of them, uh, you know, seven, eleven, they have multiple syllables, um, which is why I say da 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 And as you can see, I sort of started off a little bit uh, too fast, and I had to overcompensate. And so ideally, you don't want to start off at the wrong tempo and then compensate. You want to feel it and then hop straight in and be riding it comfortably. So let's try it again and we'll see if I can get it better. So as soon as you start to speed up, then it starts to not click. And it helps you to just reassess and scooch and update and adjust your tempo. <clears throat> All right. And, uh, you know, you might be saying this was supposed to be a music lesson. Why are you giving me basic math? Well, first of all, this is basic math, but nobody does it. And there's a lot to learn from it. Uh, so having these types of numbers on hand gives you a much clearer sense of things. And just putting a number on it, you know, there's a whole blog called Put a Number on it uh lincoln post <laughs> um so you know ideally what we're trying to do is become rhythmic athletes and so you need to be measuring you need to be keeping track of things objectively you don't want to be the guy that just goes to the gym and does however many sets of whatever weight however many reps you know uh whatever like you want to have a sense of challenging yourself and always pushing your threshold of what you're comfortable with so this is all about becoming a rhythmic athlete at the end of the day Okay, so again, uh, like we rewrote um, the quintuplets at 40 beats per minute, I'm rewriting this at 110 beats per minute in 1116. Okay, so why did I do that? Well, if we're back here and we know that each of these uh, 11 tuplets, henda couplets, whatever, is about 136 point something uh, milliseconds. Now, if we treat that 137 milliseconds as just a true blue 16th note. So basically a pulse, the tempo becomes uh, for these 16th notes. So what would the new tempo be? Basically, we have 137 times four, and then how many times does that number fit into 60,000? That gives us 110. So <clears throat> this is a nice way to avoid the tuplets and just rewrite it. So uh, additionally, I should note that, you know, uh, I say pretty much 110 because it's it's like 110.0000005 something or other. Um, but also, this is a two-measure thing, and these are identical measures. It's just different ways of parsing them visually. So 3332 versus 443 all equals 11. And sure, maybe you might sort of emphasize like da 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 versus da 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 da
it's the same content right now. It's just sort of chunked differently. But you can do a gazillion different ways of writing this. So, you know, um, you can also group 11 or whatever your meter is in uh, a ton of ways. There's a lot of rhythmic trickery to do for a future video. Okay, so now just how slow can you go? <clears throat> you know, 40 is already uncomfortable for a lot of people. 20 is kind of uh, getting to a new level where it's like, that's different. <clears throat> but if you're stuck using a normal metronome, you're kind of, you can't really go below 40. And so, you know, for instance, you might be able to use 40 beats per minute. And for every two clicks, consider that one click at 20 beats per minute. But then we're back right where we were at the beginning where we're using a faster tempo and sort of going on easy mode where it's giving us more information that we need. Um, we, again, we aren't trying to play along to something. This isn't, you know, like, you know, trying to like, conform to the grid of karaoke. This is trying to test ourselves in the lab to make sure that our machinery is finely tuned uh, to rhythmic precision. So going slower and slower helps to take a microscopic look at your rhythm and your physical mechanics and how you execute each note, which is, you know, a lot of how well-trained your nervous system is. So <clears throat> um, if we want to, you know, go any further with this, then we're just going to have to find another metronome that goes down to 20 or, you know, somewhere between 20 and 39 or, you know, held down to one even. So I have some links here. I'll put them in the description. Uh, this first one is from uh, imusic-school.com and uh, it's a metronome that goes down to 20 beats per minute. So this is kind of cool. Uh, to be honest, neither of these links is great um, just because they're like a metronome in a browser. There's something that's about using a metronome browser and I feel like sometimes after I've like really been you know in the woodshed for a while and I know that my rhythm is really <clears throat> like on point then I'll sort of feel it sort of get squirrely and it's like oh is there some latency so you know uh, make sure that you're getting a metronome that's really doing a solid job of providing you a reliable reference point because otherwise you know there's no point um, but Alternatively, you could use something like Ableton Live. I know Ableton goes down to 20 beats per minute. Um, there's probably some way to hack it to go down to one, but um, as we'll see, uh, you know, that's going to sort of require that we think a little bit differently, and it's going to challenge our sense of what uh, tempo and slowness is. Um, I would suggest that if you really want to fiddle around in this world of like extra slow tempo esoterica, then, you know, getting your hands dirty with like max msp or some sort of um you know uh station like that like a digital audio workstation like that is going to be preferable <laughs> so uh second link here from flutetunes.com is a metro uh metronome that goes down to one beat per minute and let's talk about one beat per minute okay so you know at the beginning of the lesson i was saying that we're going to talk about why slow just how slow but then also what even is slow man so let's talk about thresholds and let's talk about sort of what one beat per minute means. So just like with the faster tempos uh, eventually being perceived as subdivisions, uh, with these extra slow tempos, they're going to become more and more likely to be perceived as, you know, sort of bigger structures like periods or cycles or structures, uh, meters, forms, phrases, etc. So these are, you know, like macro structures, basically. This isn't about the fine grained uh, rhythm of it. It's more about, it's about like, you know, this section is 15 seconds long. So <clears throat> one beat per minute. This isn't going to be all that useful of a tempo as, you know, literally a tempo because it's kind of implausible. It's pretty, pretty difficult to, pretty, pretty difficult to instill a, a tempo like where each pulse takes a full minute to resolve. Um, Maybe somebody could get this, but they'd have to really have been uh, working at it for a while and like sort of ease into it. Uh, but, you know, really anything below 20 beats per minute is a bit absurd. But, you know, we're looking to be Time Lord Rhythm Ninjas. So, you know, if you want to brave these sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, tempos, then you should. Uh, so what about something like three beats per minute? Uh, this is 
three times faster than one beat per minute. So each pulse is about 20 seconds or exactly 20 seconds. Um, and so this doesn't seem entirely implausible as a tempo, but I would say that it seems to be easier to speak about in durations. You know, it makes more sense to say each pulse is 20 seconds, uh, like each even pulse is 20 seconds instead of saying there are three beats per minute because it's a lot easier to internalize 20 seconds than 60 seconds. <laughs> it's three times easier. <clears throat> okay, so a certain point, uh, you know, how slow something is, is going to be better expressed as how long it is. And uh, once we're in duration land, I'd argue that we're mostly going to be talking about the macro structures. Um, and so, you know, again, this goes back to how there's an inverse relationship between duration and uh, frequency, or, you know, the time domain and the frequency domain. Um, one is going to be sort of like additive and multiplicative. The other one's going to be divisive. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it's important to just remember that it's all just time. The substrate is all time and frequency, but frequency is a function of time. So, you know, uh, Wrapping up here, um, just some brief notes on sort of the other end of the spectrum when it comes to thresholds. That is the very finest, very fastest, uh, you know, sort of granule of time or rhythm unit. Um, so when we're talking about the fastest thing, and, you know, we'll dive into this further in a different video, but this is going to be more about the athletic capacity. This is more about stamina. It's more about um, sort of like your nervous system. It's going to be... Uh, you know, less about focusing in and like hearing when the extra slow pulse is coming back around. Um, and so when I'm dealing with this type of stuff, I like to think of it in both rate and duration um, for a number of reasons and uh, you know, a few other ways, ideally, too. But <clears throat> let's talk about like, for instance, uh, 100 milliseconds as our threshold for the finest rhythmic granule that one can sustain. You know, people could go faster than this, but, uh, you know, I'm not impressed by somebody sprinting and then slowing down, uh, you know, a little bit later. Like, we want to be able to sustain this fast pace for it to be considered a true threshold. So, um, having an absolute on it, like a, an absolute duration of 100 milliseconds, this is a pretty helpful metric uh, if you want to get gains in the time gym, as it were. But uh, it should also be put in relative terms for the sake of you know functionality and a sense of context, because this complexity of the context and the sort of logic of the rhythm will impact how difficult it is and potentially change the threshold uh, by adding more information uh, or you know sort of putting in asymmetrical stuff where uh, you have physical symmetries already baked in. For instance, like guitar picking tends to be down up down up down up or you know something along those lines or down 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 down. And so when you start making it asymmetrical, then your accents are going to be reversed. Sort of like it makes it as if you have to do everything left-handed. Sort of like uh, your dominant direction becomes uh, <laughs> like the non-dominant direction, if you will. So an example of this is a, a 100 second or sorry, 100 millisecond duration. Um, at 150 beats per minute, that's going to be a 16th note. So it's just you know, let's hear what 150 sounds like. My metronome doesn't have 150. It has 152, though. <laughs> so 16th notes here. That's pretty easy to conceive of. I can do that, uh, you know, with my mouth, even though I'm not a singer. I can say and sustain it for a good long while. However, if we say that each of those 100 milliseconds is part of a 43 tuplet <laughs> and the tempo for each pulse is 14 beats per minute that's going to be way way harder cognitively to uh keep track of because you know it's gonna mean that you have to entrain to a 14 beat per minute uh fundamental tempo then go up to that 43rd harmonic um which you know that's that's a lot of stuff that's a, a prime division of a very slow tempo and at the end of the day, it's going to still be da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -da. but it's the context that it's put in that makes it significantly more difficult uh, on your cognition. So 
that's just a, a little teaser for when we talk about playing very fast sometime. Um, but that's basically it. Uh, to just conclude, um, I would say that slow tempos are a great way to challenge your internal clock. No pain, no gain. Uh, you know, if you play along with fast tempos, it's going to be pretty obvious and you aren't challenging your internal clock. Uh, it's kind of like you have all the grids, you know, very present and you don't, you aren't maintaining responsibility for any of the, uh, any of the grid yourself. You want to be the grid. You don't want to be the picture on the grid. Um, you want to be the whole thing and you want to just have something that's keeping you honest. So, um, like I just said, uh, you know, the metronome at the slow tempo keeps you honest and you can use it to kind of zoom in on your rhythm and your timekeeping and your technique and all that. So you want to use it more as a tool in the lab than you want to use it as like a sort of like bad drummer that has no style that is just keeping time for you. Um, now they also open up the door for, uh, the world of divisive rhythms, such as tuplets, polyrhythms, and other complexities like this. I think that they're ideal for that, since each pulse kind of has a reasonable threshold for humans. You know, the example being 208 milliseconds, or sorry, uh, 208 beats per minute is definitely not an ideal tempo to practice, <laughs> uh, you know, even 16th notes at, uh, let alone quintuplets or septuplets or uh hen deck couplets <laughs> um so next uh the ability to conceive of duration and frequency as inverse domains creates opportunities to unify your compositions across different scales so this is kind of like uh a weird big statement to make but uh this allows you to go top down as well as bottom up if you're uh you know sort of always thinking in terms of rates and you never think in terms of durations and you never see how they uh, relate to each other and they are the same substrate, then I think that you're potentially missing out on some deep stuff and deep ways to unify um, the different scales. You know, like, you know, we talk about timbre, we talk about, uh, you know, spectra, we talk about pitch, uh, you know, like pitch information, uh, temperaments, tunings, uh, rhythm, tempo, uh, you know, envelope, all this type of stuff. It's all time information. And so when you can start to unify them, there's a nice sort of kaleidoscopic beauty to it uh, that I think is worth uh, getting comfortable with. So then uh, last few points, slowness eventually hits a threshold or a point where it, you know, quote unquote, becomes duration, or it's just simply better to express it as a length of time or a duration of time rather than a uh, frequency or a rate of time. So, <clears throat> you know, when you're at three beats per minute, that is a nice, simple sounding number, but physically as a human, you're gonna have trouble embodying that in those terms. Um, while it's essentially the still thing, the still, essentially it's still the same thing, doing, um, you know, 20 second pulses, like 20 second durations as your pulses is gonna be a little bit easier to think of because, you know, otherwise you're doing things in terms of a minute it's very hard to maintain a minute in the back of your mind uh, and keep it, you know, physically ingrained. <clears throat> All right. So uh, lastly, you can empirically evaluate your accuracy when it comes to and training to this reference point. So you, know, you can record yourself with a metronome. You can slow it down. You can look at it visually. You can zoom up in a digital audio workstation and say, oh, dang, I have perfect time. Everything's lined up perfectly on the grid. Or you can say, how did it get a different metronome setting that uh, like this can't be me? And if that's the case, you probably need to spend some time in the shed. But if you're able to systematically improve your ability to entrain to a reference point, whether it's alpha brain waves or 150 beat per minute juke tempo, um, you know, hey, I feel like there's some potential that you might improve some sort of element of your emotional intelligence along the way according to this idea of entrainment quotient and uh, the stuff that Mike Johnson is talking about on opentheory.net. So uh, that's basically the presentation. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, commenting on the video is also very much appreciated and leaving a thumbs up and all that. Um, it helps with the algorithm and you know helps to spread the content to new viewers. So if you can do that, that'd be much appreciated. Also, if you want to support the creation of content like this, 
then you can head on over to patreon.com slash lambertronics and uh, options start off as low as just a few bucks a month. But uh, you know there are various benefits such as early access and exclusive access to content. And I do uh, a lot of you know dumps of zip files here of scores, MIDI files, audio files, that type of thing. Uh, and you can get early access to lessons like this. So uh, if you enjoyed this, please consider heading over to Patreon. But otherwise, thanks for watching and I will talk to you in the future. Thanks. Bye.